Good afternoon. Kimberly Bryant once said, anytime you get more than a couple of Black women together, you're creating this powerful mechanism of change. The National Council of Churches Coalition Plus One welcomes you to our May webinar experience entitled Black Women, Black Maternal Health and Reparations. Post we tune our hearts and our minds in this moment towards Buffalo, New York. We tune our hearts and minds also to California in silent reflection and contemplative thought. Post that the next speaking voice you will hear will be that of Reverend Sakina Hamlin. Now for our moment of silence. Amen. Certainly when we planned this webinar series and had uh, May being the time in which we would talk about black women and black maternal health and reparations. We did not know that there would be a leaked brief from the Supreme Court of these hopefully soon to be United States detailing a way of which the agency of women would be taken away. Now I will say that all of the denominations within our NCC plus one coalition may have different theological stances on this. But one thing we can all agree on is that these United States, the slave trade that went throughout the world certainly is one that historically has commodified Black women's bodies and have thought that they had agency over the bodies that God gave us. And so we're grateful that in God's divine providence, we're having this webinar for such a time as this. And we're so very grateful that the person that will lead us off in a theological reflection of Black women, of motherhood, of reparatory justice, is not only the Reverend Dr. Stephanie Buchanan Crowder. We're thankful to have her with us today. She's the academic dean of the Chicago Theological Seminary. She's duly ordained with the American Baptist as well as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. She is a longtime show enough preacher, educator, as well as author. And certainly her most recent book, I have to hold this up, When Mama Speaks, <laughs> the Bible and motherhood from a womanist perspective is one of the books that I definitely have on my nightstand and reread over and over again. So Dr. Buchanan Crowder, come and talk to us. Open up the word. Well, good afternoon um, to, to all of you. Thank you, Reverend Hamlin, for um, a kind introduction. And, and um, I appreciate the hyperbole and the exaggeration, and we'll try to live up to all that you have stated there. I'm very grateful um, for this opportunity um, to share, realizing that you know there's a sense of gratitude, but then there's also a sense of gravitas, um, you know, on so many levels where we are in our country. And I think it is um, no it doesn't get lost on us that for such a time as this, we are indeed talking about repertory justice and talking about ways in which Black mothers, Black women um, are impacted 
um, by justice and sometimes injustice, um, if you will. So thank, thank you to all of you um, for the invitation. I am grateful um, for what will be our, our time together. And so um, let, let's begin. Let's just go ahead and get started. In her 1892 address entitled Enlightened Motherhood, um, proto-womanist Frances Ellen Watkins Harper notes, every mother should be a true artist. I do not mean this, that every woman should be a painter, sculptor, musician, poet, or writer, but the artist who will write on the table of childish innocence thoughts she will not blush to see red in the light of eternity and printed amid the archives of heaven. Frances Ellen Watkins Hart Harper on Enlightened Motherhood. The world is now two plus years into this COVID-19 context. Millions across the globe and now a million in the United States have to succumb to a microscopic virus, education, religious institutions, Political thinking have shifted and in many ways we are recalibrating our modalities in light of this microscopic virus. And no, theological institutions have not gone unscathed. What was once the, the bread and butter of our meeting in person through classes of our meeting in person in our religious institutions and in our temples and mosques and synagogues and churches where now we've had to pivot to online positioning and virtual instruction and virtual worship. This accelerated shift to remote working and worshiping and teaching has yielded moments of tedious rumination. So yes, as Amanda Gorman writes, pandemic, pandemonium, Pandora, and yes, we need companions during this time. To quote the late Theo sociomusicologist Luther Vandross, such are the times when a house is not a home. The past two plus years, home has been faculty office, gym, preschool, classroom. It's been the pastor's study. A womanist maternal thinking gaze is that which says that as a mother, we wrestle with racism, sexism, and classism, and the sundries of isms and phobias that were, yes, pre-existing conditions before the pandemic. We were experiencing an existential pandemic before the pandemic. COVID-19 just exacerbated these systemic and systematically oppressive measures. A womanist maternal hermeneutic brings to the forefront the voices of Black mothers within this racial, ethnic, spiritual and sociological context, whether the mothers are biological or women for, for whatever reason who took responsibility for another's child. Womanist maternal thought addresses the specific racial context of black women and the mothering challenges connected to it. It purports vicissitudes that are unique to mothers in this social and racial context, context and therefore is not universal. Examining motherhood through the lens of Black women maintains that circumstances that would seem to be general in nature become compounded due to race factors. I purport that Black women, Black mothers, not only have to filter through sexist measures and racial roadblocks, but they, we, must also find ways to maneuver systemic blockades and speed bumps that devalue familial status. Thus, there is a triplicate hardship through which Black women who are mothers have to pummel. A womanist maternal thought is a triple layered approach to the understanding of the nature of what it means to be Black, a Black woman, and a Black mother. There's a fourth dimension which yields a, I guess you could say a womanist maternal quadrilateral. This method not only scrutinizes the intersection of race and family and gender constructions related to black mothers, but I also hold up to the light class dynamics. Womanist maternal thought underscores economic status and its connection to black mothers who work. The framework examines how categorical employment defines and is a determining factor in a Black mother's fiscal standing and status. 
womanist maternal thinking undergirds that a core component of the role of black mothers is their work or work as defined as activity contributing to their children's wholeness and well-being. Why mention womanist maternal thought in a COVID-19 context? Well, questions compel us to pause. Estimates of over 3 million women left the workplace during this COVID-19 crisis, according to Cerulio. In many families, Black women are the primary caregivers and have had to juggle working at home with children who are also at home. And yes, we've returned to this kind of now going back to school and now going back into the office, but that's for some. That's not a universal mode, if you will. The jobs of mom, manager, teacher, counselor, cafeteria, CEO, all morphed into one online profession with little to no Zoom relief and at the same pay, but with exponential stress. The Bookings Institute contends that most Black mothers tend to be single, many by choice, where family support is limited or non-existent, mothers are the be all end all in a pandemic or not. In addition, any number of black mothers work low wage paying jobs where paid time off is a premium. And you know that COVID-19 hit sectors such as retail and hospitality and dining the hardest. And these are the industries that tend to employ any number of black women. Why mention womanist maternal thought in a COVID-19 context? There is a dearth of scaffolding around race and childcare. The privilege of taking leave with pay to take care of child or self does not come so easily. Are there exceptions? Absolutely. The academy and some of us have jobs and careers that afford such luxuries, but yet, According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, student mothers have fewer hours to spend on their studies. Why talk about Black and womanist maternal thought in a COVID-19 context? Well, Black maternal health was compromised pre-pandemic. Black women were four times to five times more likely to die in childbirth before COVID-19. The well-being of expecting Black women remains just as precarious. While it will be some time before substantial COVID-19 impact data is ascertained, the stress, the stress, the stress from the pandemic, economic fallout for families, and that Black people in general have been three to four times more likely to die from the virus all offer a dim glimpse of what could be the effects on Black expecting mothers. From a different maternal angle, a June 2020 report from the Gamacha Institute discovered that more than 40% of women had changed their plans for motherhood because of COVID-19. Of the over 2,000 cisgendered women ages 18 to 49 who were surveyed, 44% of the Black women said that they now want fewer kids or have decided to have them later. They note factors such as testing positive for, co testing positive for COVID or uncertainty around sound prenatal treatment as some of the factors. This political tyrannical train of disemboweling and dismantling Roe versus Wade is more than just a right to life or a right to choose, but it's about a right to breathe, a right to survive, a right to have health care, a right to provide. When mothers are traveling miles and miles and hours and hours to find baby formula, huh? What saith these political peddlers? Who says a woman can no longer determine the use of her uterus? or the functioning of her fallopian tubes. The powers that be want to hold the, the standard of choice, but when the rubber of care, provision, access, and equity hits the road, somehow the court jesters are mute. 
Why mention womanist maternal thought in a COVID-19 complex? Well, questions call us to pensive positioning. This past week, among the black people carnage in Buffalo were mothers, grandmothers, mothers of the church, a community mother who had fed the hungry and who was a mother to the motherless. Yet white supremacy, mediocrity, boredom, and hatred got to walk out of the grocery store escorted wearing a badge of supremacist honor. Why talk about <laughs> womanist maternal thought? Because from birthing centers to daycare facilities, to sanctuaries of churches and mosques and temples and synagogues, to the corridors of colleges and universities, to the, to the hallways of our office buildings, the coronavirus has left nothing unsullied or unscathed. Homes were, and some still are, community centers, recreation centers, cafeterias, playgrounds, homerooms, first through six periods and soon to be summer camps. Parents were teachers and many still are the teachers. Big mama was the tutor, Nana was the IT director, Medea was the principal, Papa was the guidance counselor, a womanist maternal lens. In these COVID-19 times, illumines community mothers, other mothers, auntie sister moms, uncle moms, church mothers and all maternal figures in whatever gender manifestation and identification, whether biological or not. This has been, this remains an all maternal hands on deck state of emergency. Conditions may have ameliorated slightly, but things are not completely resolved. As a biblical scholar, administrator, author, minister, and more importantly, a mother of now two adult children, two adult sons, yes, I accept Francis Ellen Watkins Harper's call to be that maternal artist. With the pen of Nikki Giovanni, I want to write poetic power in my children's soul with the soul of Aretha Franklin, I tend them and lead them to respect and to see that respect is the rule, not the exception. With the camera angle acumen of Carrie Mae Weems, we must teach our children to frame a world that seeks to demand equity for the decentered, the dispossessed, and the diseased. With the soothing sound of her, we have to tell our children that it is okay to take a time out and be still. With the genius of Toni Morrison, let's teach our children to write themselves into history, to write themselves into a world that wants to erase and mute them. With the scientific prowess of Mae Jemison and Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn, let our children know that NASA can't limit them where the Holy One wishes to take them. No space can hold where they desire to go. With the fight of Fannie Lou, the eloquence of Ella Baker, the courage of Prathia Hall, Diane Nash, and Amelia Boynton Robertson, let's show our children that they can't rest on our civil rights laurels. They can't rest on Black Lives Matter moves that they still, we still need to pray with our feet and protest with our prayers. And in the memory of the mother Emmanuel nine and the Buffalo 10 and the too many who've been lost because boys like their gun toys, let's teach our children that hell no, this is not the America. This is not the world that we want with the communal core that is you and you and him and her and they and she and him and them and Zer, no one will tell us what to do with our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our souls. Yeah, when it gets crazy, when it gets crunked, that's when true artists, that's when true maternal artists get to work. Thank you for your time.
Lord have mercy, my God. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Buchanan Crowder. Thank you so much. And certainly she has laid this state of emergency out for us and invited us to be those artists. And I'm thankful then that we're gonna have two dynamic women to lead us in this next section. For they are the ones that tend to be right in there in the pews with Sally and Joe Pew, if you will, uh, making sure that they lead people in the application of this knowledge. And so now that we have our womanist maternal thought glasses on, if you will, we're going to hear from the Reverend Laura Kigueva James, who is the Director of Grassroots Organizing for the General Board of Church and Society for the United Methodist Church. We're also going to hear from Reverend Christian Brooks, who is the representative for domestic issues for the Office of Public Witness of the Presbyterian Church USA. Both of these women have long experience in taking these issues and applying them in such a way that people in the pews can make sure that they change this world for the better. And so we welcome you all as you present to us. Thank you so much, Sakina. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Let me get my screen shared here because we have an amazing presentation for you all. Okay, thumbs up if you can see it. Awesome, awesome. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for attending this important conversation today. As was mentioned, my name is Christian Brooks. I'm the representative for domestic issues at the Presbyterian Church USA Office of Public Witness. And uh, today I, along with my colleague, uh, Reverend Laura Kigueva James, will be talking about the Black maternal health crisis and how it connects to reparations. So as we dive into this, um, as we dive into this discussion, it's really important that we start with historical context of Black maternal health and the abuses of Black women's bodies. Since being forcibly brought to the United States, Black women have consistently fought for bodily autonomy. During enslavement, it was very common for Black women to be used as breeders and wet nurses. So women were forced to procreate with enslaved men and were raped by their masters in order to have children to supply laborers for the enslaved workforce. And this was to ensure that enslavement could continue to flourish as a profitable institution. Let me say that again. Women were forced to have children in order to supply laborers for an enslaved workforce so their owners could keep making money and the United States could have a profitable industry, which was enslavement. But then black women were also forced to be wet nurses where black enslaved mothers were forced to breastfeed the children of their white owners. Now, oftentimes if the wife of a white owner became pregnant an enslaved woman would be forced to become pregnant as well. And this is so that her body was prepared to care for the owner's child when the baby was born. And unfortunately, due to wet nursing, wet nurses, the Black enslaved women, were often unable to care for their own children. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, everyone, uh, for this intentional um, conversation uh, that I can't lose sight that hits very close to home. And so I wanna hold space for that for all the black folks on the call uh, and what it means to have this conversation. Um, my name is Reverend Laura Kigueva James, uh, Director of uh, Grassroots Organizing at the General Board of Church and Society. And I want to take us to, to center this conversation in the narrative. Um, often it's easy to think about this as a topic over there, but I want to bring faces and stories. So I invite you in this moment to join me in the grass with Miss Martha Jackson, 
to join me by the tree, to stand with her um, as she talks about her experience. And as uh, Reverend Dr. Crowder, as you invited us, her experience of the womanist uh, maternal thought. And she offers this. Lottie Lottie Dem was tribulations. One of these here umans was my auntie. And she say that she scarcely called to mind. He her whooping her cause she was a breeder woman and brought in chillin' every 12 months, just like a cow bringing in a calf. Martha Jackson, Alabama. Next slide, please. What kind of society existed for this to be true? As Christian said, this is a true account of the niece of an aunt who was a breeder, who every 12 months brought in a child. And we don't know how many children, but that that was her daily act. But we also know that she was so much more than that. She was an aunt, she was a mother, a daughter. But what kind of society existed for this to be true? Next slide. Womanist theologian Dolores Williams explains that this is the foundations of the US society built by the violent exploitation of black women's bodies. She writes in her essay, Sin, Nature, and Black Women's Bodies that the exploitation of black women's bodies was rationalized to the advantage of white slave owners. Female slaves were beaten, overworked, and made to experience excessive childbearing in order to provide income, comfort, and leisure for slave-owning families. Because in the 19th century, slave owner consciousness imaged Black people as belonging to a lower order of nature than white people. Black people were to be controlled and tamed. Martha's memories of her aunt's experience and the white social consciousness that imagined Black bodies being controlled and tamed by white bodies is not a past reality, but is a present truth that impacts the quality and access to equitable health care and the overall well-being of Black bodies and all non-white bodies within our society. And as people of faith, Advocating for reparations, we must recognize and make these connections between the history of Black bodies struggling for bodily autonomy, the present maternal health crisis, and our inequitable healthcare system in order to confront and understand what truly needs to be repaired. So in the U.S. context, a vision of reparations must speak to and address not just years of exploitation and violence, but must include the millions of Black bodies that have been harmed by this violence and continue to be harmed today. Next slide. Anarka Westcott, Betsy, Lucy, and other Black women whose names we are still gathering are known as the mothers of gynecology. And this is a monument created by Michelle Browder in Birmingham, Alabama. These women were enslaved in the US and their bodies were violently harmed by Marion Sims who forcibly operated on these women without the use of anesthesia. And these unjust, and unmedicated operations have informed and continue to inform the development of modern obstetrics. I always struggle with this word, obstetrics, there we go, and gynecology in our present healthcare system in the US. This legacy of harm and violence of black bodies in our society and specifically in our US medical system has perpetuated ongoing disproportionate disproportionate care that impacts Black women's experience in living and giving life. Next slide. A Black birthing person in the US today confronts this mountain of historically racist and sociopolitical realities before they even step foot into a doctor's office. One of the most notable realities that health researchers have identified, and as Dr. Crowder spoke to earlier, is defined as weathering. 
Weathering is a physical erosion of the body based on the constant stress from systemic racism and other social oppressions. The racial stress that we as Black people endure from white terrorism, microaggressions, and living in a society informed by a legacy of racism and white supremacy wears on our health, our bodies, and impacts the ability for us as Black birthing people to have the healthy pregnancy and birthing experience that we all deserve. And by the time we enter the doctor's office, our bodies are also subjected to the lack of access of quality care from a hospital, as well as the implicit bias by the medical professional that we see. And and who sees us as objects to be controlled and tamed. And this is all connected to the racist history that Martha's aunt experienced, that Martha experienced, that Anarka, Betsy, Lucy, and millions of black bodies have endured in this country. And because of these things that Laura has shared, as was mentioned before, Black women and birthing persons are three to four times more likely to die from a pre pregnancy related cause than white women. In fact, in 2020, the maternal mortality rate for Black women and birthing persons was 55.3 deaths per 100,000 births, compared to 23.8 deaths for the overall population. Many of these pregnancy complications were preventable. And the heightened risk of pregnancy related deaths for Black women and birthing persons spans across income and education levels. Now, as Laura has mentioned, there are several factors that are, um, that are involved in this. And some include healthcare. Women of color are more likely to be uninsured prior to their pregnancy and lose coverage at the end of the 60 day Medicaid postpartum coverage period. And research shows that coverage before, during, and after pregnancy leads to more positive maternal and if it health outcomes. There's also health services. Black Americans also often have limited access to adequate health service provi health care providers and health services. And the rise of closures of hospitals in rural areas has had a disproportionate impact on Black women. Discrimination in hospitals, as has been mentioned, Black women experience higher rates of mistreatment by medical providers over the course of their pregnancy. Reports show that there have been maternal deaths or near deaths as a result of providers not listening to or being slow to listen to Black women. Food insecurity. Black women are disproportionately impacted by food insecurity. Black Americans are twice as likely to be food insecure than the national average. Food insecurity may increase stress hormones, which has been linked to preterm birth, as well as unhealthy changes in a mother's pregnancy weight. Food insecurity can also affect a pregnant woman's blood pressure and more, which increases a pregnant person's likelihood of developing obesity, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure. And this is really important to note because these factors can lead to cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of maternal death in the United States. Hmm. But then there's also climate and environment related risks. Many climate and environment related risks have a direct impact on maternal health, including extreme heat, air pollution, flooding, hurricanes. Black Americans are more likely to be impacted by these factors. For example, due to redlining, Black Americans face a disproportionate burden of air pollution compared to their white counterparts, which has a negative effect on maternal and infant health. Mm. So in the US, 
we have these key factors that we experience as Black people. And then we have this history of exploitation, extraction, commodification that we have endured on our Black bodies. Instead of being seen and being of inherent and sacred and worthy as we are created by God. And this is why Black Lives Matter. And with this truth, there is this way that we can collectively see and value the sacred worth of Black bodies and all non-white bodies without perpetuating a painful legacy of racism and white supremacy. And it begins by learning and retelling this history so that we can dismantle the historic harm with new perspectives centered in our collective dignity, rights, and value. And one way to recognize this history is to honor the multitude of resistant legacies that have advocated and continue to center the dignity and rights of Black bodies when the US society did not and does not. So these legacies are held in the thousands of Black midwives who before Black people could access hospital services performed home births that centered our dignity and care. And some of these legendary midwives are right before you, as you see, include Maud Collin, Bridget Biddy Mason, Mary Frances Hill, Coley, Ani Lee Logan, and Margaret Charles Smith, and a thousands more. We speak their names. And even though in the early 20th century, the dignified practice of midwifery was systemically prohibited through legislation, and Black women were forced to enter into inequitable hospital systems that did not value their dignity and care. The legacy of these women still stands, and today there is a growing presence of community midwifery and doula care that cultivates a positive environment and a just birthing experience for all. Another legacy of resistance is in the advocacy for healthcare and reform. If we can go to the next slide. So in June of 1994, a group of Black women known as the Women of African Descent for Reproductive Justice coined the term reproductive justice and defined it as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not to have children, and to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. That definition is by Sister Song. And these legacies of resistance give us hope and a way of seeing the world that is not just a one single issue that needs to be addressed, but seeing the intersections of how the issues of race, gender, class, and economics all connect. So Black feminist Audre Lorde writes that there is no thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So in order for us to unlearn these harmful truths, we must embrace the reality of the intersections, like in this conversation today on maternal health and reparations so that we as communities of faith can act. And as you walk away from this conversation today, we are calling you to action. We have been fiercely advocating for the passage of the Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus Act of 2021, which was introduced into the House of Representatives on February 8th of 2021, is a bill that is uh, composed of 12 individual bills aimed at increasing maternal health. As people of faith, we have a vital role to play in supporting policies like these that ensure the safety and health of all birthing persons and babies. So I'm putting the action alert in the chat. This is the PCUSA's action alert. And I'm urging you to contact your member of Congress today and tell them to support the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act. But in addition to the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, we are also calling for support of HR 40. HR 40 is a bill that we have been calling for on all of our webinars. 
because we see how the legacy of enslavement and systemic racism has had a huge effect on Black women, Black mothers, Black bodies. And it is due time for this country to own up to it and to make repair for it. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Sakina. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your presentations. I'll invite Reverend Antonia Coleman to come forward so that she can um, give us final comments and send us out with a word of prayer. Let's just take a quick breath. Let's take a quick breath. I see Reverend Dr. Stephanie Buchanan Crowder moving her head left and right, shoulders. Let's just breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. And breathe out from this moment. We invite the words of ancestor Maya Angelou when she says, when women take care of their health, they become their best friend. In this moment, I thank each and every one of you who has taken, who have taken their time to spend with us, to co-convene on this topic of Black women, Black maternal health, and reparations. You have received your marching orders, and we are inviting you to march with us. And we leave this place in the power of the Black midwives of resistance to continue in the way that we are going to stand up and uh, build up and continue to, yes, fight and press toward the mark of the high calling, which is in us. And that high calling is the reparations for our good health, which is our civil right. I, you know, I feel a moan in my spirit I feel in the I feel my grandmother in her tradition where she she just go to but I'm not going to do that to y'all today. I'm just going to say may the great spirit go before you to make your way safe, easy, successful, peaceful, prosperous, abundant, and productive your way is my continued prayer for each of you. Take care and enjoy your day. <laughs>